Okay, the final item of business this evening is a member's business debate on motion 10453 in the name of Claire Adamson on uh, Scottish Games Week 2023. The debate will be concluded without any questions being put. I, I'd ask members uh, who wish to participate to press the request to speak buttons and invite Claire Adamson to open the debate around seven minutes. Ms Adamson. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. I'm thrilled to be opening the debate in the Chamber tonight as the constituency MSP for Motherwell and Wishaw and for complete transparency, chaotic neutral. I want to thank my colleagues in the Chamber for their participation and support in the motion. Last year was the inaugural Scottish Games Week and I'd like to pay tribute to the indomitable Brian Braglow of Scottish Games Network for drawing it together. His determined advocacy for the game sector in Scotland has brought gaming into the spotlight and it was brilliant to see the fruits of his labour in Dynamic Earth for the opening of the conference. There's a plethora of exciting events still to come this week until the 7th of November, so please do get involved where you can. So why is the game sector underrepresented in our public policy? And crucially, how are we going to change that? The games industry is the largest entertainment media in the world by some distance. Global market revenues stand at two $114.2 billion, with a projected annual growth of 8.4%. The sector eclipses traditional entertainment media, worth more than the music and video industries combined. And the headline figures paint a picture of a colossal economic potential. But the game sector is much more than that. The game sector is an ecosystem. And if we can support the games ecosystem in Scotland to thrive, it will bring enormous benefits to our society economically and, yes, socially and culturally too. We all know the big players. We're not far from one of them. But I'm interested in looking at the big, not the big players, but the big picture in Scotland. So there are innovative, innovative small studios across the country and they need our sport to flourish. It takes a lot to make a game and it's a hard slog. But there are opportunities for software developers, coders, engineers, actors, artists, musicians, writers, animators, graphic designers, translators, advertisers, educators, lawyers, event planners, and I could go on and on, presiding officer. But the games industry will touch every aspect of our lives, every sector of the economy, health and our health and social contract with the people of Scotland. With a little more co collaboration, and a drive to co a coordinated public policy, we can make the most of this ecosystem in Scotland. People in the room might not think they're gamers, but if you've used in, or enjoyed game tech without knowing it, you've probably used it without knowing it. Just about every film being produced in Hollywood now is reliant upon game engines for their effects. You may be playing Wordle or Candy Crush and forget snakes in a plane. You might even be doing snakes on your phone in the chamber as we speak or have done so in the past. <laughs> the sector is thriving globally. It can provide employment, it can build skills and development, it can foster community and it can even foster social change. You might remember the story of the virtual library on Minecraft created by the Reporters Without Borders, which has hosted important works censored by their states. Articles by Jamal Khashoggi, the journalist killed by Saudi agents in 2018, amongst others that can be read there. For me, that's a perfect example of games being used in ways that few of us could have envisaged or imagined. Have you considered video, video games as a vehicle for social change? Academia is starting to demonstrate the benefits that games can through social inclusion and challenging inequalities in um, games events and games competitions. Um, and research by Harshada Balasabramanian of the University College London indicates that investing in inclusion can improve the overall experience for all games users and expand design and innovation. Gaming is changing our social and cultural norms, but the game sector remains somewhat poorly understood. We need to challenge tired perceptions of video games and recognise that gamifying of industries like forestry, helicopter training, remote surgery, the list goes on. And we know that gaming can improve cognition and research and is increasingly promising around the use of games technology in learning and managing conditions such as dementia and Parkinson's. 
think we, we, we could achieve with a coordinated approach to our games ecosystem. One fit for purpose where the creativity of the industry is fully recognised and valued and supported. For example, unlike Wales and England and Toronto in Canada, our game system sits out with Screen Scotland alongside uh, other organisations in the of Scotland such as Crafts. But should it be there? And we need to have that conversation with the industry. In many respects, the sector in Scotland is doing well. Following the inaugural Scottish Games Week last year, I was pleased to see the launch of Techscaler funded by the Scottish Government and delivered by Codebase. This tension between creati creativity and commerce was highlighted by a report from Glasgow University and Stirling University with the Scottish Games number network called InGame the Scottish Games ecosystem, the state of play. There are colleges across Scotland offering education courses. Abertay is held out as a totemic example of games specific education. But our school curriculum and our college curriculum needs to keep pace with AI developments. But we're only just embedding coding skills at the moment. ChatGPT can do the coding for you as highlighted by keynote speaker Rob Ellsworthy, lecturer at Toronto Film School and studio head at the, at the launch of the Games Network. We need to link opportunity with schools and colleges and with their apprenticeships. Generally, we need more co collaboration between the Games and other sectors. We can't see opportunity and funding being taken up in the north of England and in Wales because Games in Scotland are shut off from the funders from their film industries. Previously, you lived or died by your ability to get into the largest magazine publication, but new form platforms like Steam and Discord mean that Twitch and YouTube have changed all of that. And many of the developers don't go into gaming to become entrepreneurs or business leaders. The feedback from Scottish Games Week suggests that supporting developers on the commercial side it's a key challenge for public policy and something we need to model to suit the ecosystem in Scotland. Small business startup models traditionally supported by local gateways or Scottish enterprise simply do not support the industry in the way that they need to grow. Studios like Team Terrible and their mega hit Baby, The Baby in Yellow is a glowing example of the new success stories. But we could replicate these successes over and over again. I was dejected to hear that Scottish Games Week has lost out on its ecosystem funding for next year. But we are building momentum for this sector and we need public institutions behind it. A healthy, vibrant games ecosystem in Scotland supported by collaborative and strategic public policy will bring immense social, cultural and economic benefits alongside innovations that we cannot yet predict. In short, the game sector is here to play, and that is a World Cup Scotland could be winning. And thank you, President. Well thank you very much, uh, Ms. Adamson, for the avoidance of doubt. Playing Candy Crush is not in keeping with acceptable chamber uh, behaviour and will be strongly discouraged. We move to the open debate. I call first Morris Golden to be followed by Stephanie Callaghan. Around four minutes, uh, Mr. Better, better put my phone down, Deputy President Officer. Um, after the success of the inaugural event last year, it's great to see the return of the second Scottish Games Week. Once again, this year will give all involved the opportunity to come together, collaborate and celebrate the wonderful success story that is the Scottish gaming sector. And at this point, I'd like to welcome and congratulate uh, Claire Adamson for securing uh, time for this debate. Uh, this evening. But you can't s celebrate this success story without talking about the role Dundee has played in it. I remember back in the early 1990s as a young boy playing Lemmings, such a simple but compelling strategy game where you had to instruct little creatures to fulfill a number of roles with the purpose of navigating through puzzles and moving on to the next level. Who, who knew those skills would come in so handy 25 years later when I was chief whip to the Scottish Conservatives? Uh, I had no idea at the time that Lemmings 
had been developed in the Perth Road in Dundee, just a short distance away from where I was playing it. And with 20 million copies sold, that game ultimately transformed DMA design and put it on the pathway to what would go on to become Rockstar North, not only transforming the company's fortunes, but the catalyst for transforming Dundee into one of the most globally significant centres for computer game development. The role of Dundee-based companies in the development of iconic games such as Minecraft and Grand Theft Auto cannot be understated. Both of these titles now stand globally at number one and two in terms of the best-selling video games of all time. And those playing Grand Theft Auto would be forgiven for thinking the game has come straight out of Silicon Valley with the way in which it captures, uh, at least in part, American culture. But maybe it's the comedic and satirical nature in which it often does that gives its Scottish roots away, as well as the numerous Easter eggs dotted through the series that give a nod to its Dundonian and Scottish origins. Abertay University also need recognition, who in 1997 had the foresight to be the first university to offer gaming-related degrees, all of which has contributed to Dundee being an incubator for computer game development. The number of computer game companies based in the city is now in double figures, and there are significant employers of well-paid jobs with excellent career progression opportunities. Maybe the culmination of Dundee's history and present as a world leader in computer game development is the proposed 4,000-seater eSports arena for the city, a multi-purpose arena at Dundee's waterfront, which will host live concerts and events and we can all hope that these plan out plans are fully realised as soon as possible. Deputy Presiding Officer, I commend all those who have supported the computer, uh, computer games industry in Dundee over the last few decades, from the visionary games developers, the private investors, the universities and colleges, local government, Scotland's two governments, and call on public sector partners to keep focus on Dundee redouble your efforts, and let's keep Dundee as the epicentre of UK computer game development. Thank you very much, uh, Mr Golden. Lemons falls into the same category as Candy Crush when it comes to chamber etiquette. Um, I now call uh, Stephanie Callaghan to be followed by Pam duncan Glanson. Around four minutes, Ms Callaghan. President Officer, um, I thank my colleague Claire Adamson for securing this debate and the great speeches so far this evening. Um, it was good to hear Minecraft mentioned. I have to say, I'm, I was very glad when it went digital because I've lost track of how much money I spent on s replacing scratch discs. But the world of, of gaming has undeniably undergone a remarkable evolution. We've witnessed a journey that started with iconic arcade games like Space Invaders and has now evolved into mind-blowing virtual reality where we immerse ourselves in uncharted worlds, confront fresh challenges and conquer epic quests and where my mum has a little shot and crashes into the TV too. And here in Scotland, as we've heard, gaming contributes 350 million, around that amount, to our economy. And homegrown, cutting-edge creativity from companies like Rockstar North are a source of huge national pride that goes beyond Dundee. Presiding officer, with three teenagers at home, I'm no stranger to gaming. And as well as nagging about screen time, I've also seen the positive impacts on my kids' personal development critical life skills and cultural awareness and I'll be focusing on the positives in tonight's speech. Gaming can be so much more than childhood fun. It can play a fundamental role in enhancing the educational experience, improving cognitive function, learning of facts and increasing cultural awareness. Due to the built-in reward system such as points, levels, progress bars, track advancement and feedback, games are especially motivating and stimulating compared to other types of educational interventions. Association of Video Gaming with Cognitive Performance Among Children is the name of a study by researchers at the University of Vermont that found children who played video games for three hours a day showed higher brain activity in areas associated with attention and memory compared to non-players. 
I have my own examples too, presiding officer. Our teen son's in-depth knowledge of Egypt's people, geography, history and artefacts surprised us during a random dinner table conversation. When asked if he's been studying Egypt at school, he said he learned from the game Assassin's Creed, explaining how he used detailed maps for navigation, collected ancient artefacts to move up the levels, and also earned points for completing quests that he would later spend on medical aid and advanced equipment. So a little bit of maths in there too. Young gamers are many exemplars of clever problem solvers. They're confronted with challenges and rise to the occasion to solve complex cognitive tasks with critical thinking and creativity. Repeated failures are just a step on the road to success, fostering resilience in the face of setbacks and really encouraging gamers to persistently hone their skills and to keep on pushing their own limits, all essential life skills. And believe me, my children don't give up until they achieve that epic win. Gaming can act as a form of escapism for many, yet it's also an experience to be shared with others. Through mutual objectives and achievements, gaming is capable of building strong social connections and relationships, even be between children who live in the opposite sides of this world. Online gaming can be especially meaningful for autistic people and others with neurodiverse profiles, because communication happens on a more level playing field. Without the challenges of trying to read facial expressions and body language, things they often struggle with daily. Gaming is a more comfortable, autonomous and goal-driven way of making friends. And it's been suggested that gaming interest is higher in autistic people, and that would make sense that having structure and predictable rules is very appealing to this group. And positive reinforcement can motivate autistic people to keep playing and prolong their ability to engage with others. Now, while I do respect and acknowledge problematic behaviours associated with gaming, it really is important to acknowledge the benefits too. And I would say as parents, we're used to imparting lessons to our children, but we can learn le valuable lessons from them. I've certainly found that gaming is a way to do that, and there is something amazing and quite wonderful in learning from our children. Presiding officer, I would encourage parents to engage with their children's gaming. Perhaps the next time they feel the urge to nag about screen time, they might instead take the time to join the play, celebrate their children's achievements, and be led by them on their own terms. And know as well that you'd be playing your part in Claire Adamson's call to support Scotland's gaming ecosystem. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms Dallahan. And I now call Pam Duncan Glancy around four minutes, please. Thank you, Deputy President Officer, and I'd like to thank Claire Adamson for bringing this important debate to the Chamber today. As others have said, Scotland has massive potential in the games industry. It contributes £129 million in direct and indirect tax revenue to our GDP. Scotland-based games development companies invest £141 million in jobs and are responsible for employing 6,400 people. It is already part of our economy and the Glasgow region where I represent. With the highest number of gaming companies in Glasgow operating there in, than in any other region in Scotland, Glasgow has and will play a key part in developing Scotland's contribution to the industry and the economy. From our strong record in the creative industries to the presence of world-class educating institutions like the Glasgow School of Art, the Royal Conservatoire and many schools, colleges and universities in this space too, we have the potential to grow the impact of gaming in Glasgow even more. Design officer, as a sector, games sit at the intersection of the creative, digital, screen and technological industries. And we have to celebrate its role in all of these industries if we're to help it grow. We must recognise that as well as computing experts and engineers, it needs arts and artists, design and designers, maths and mathematicians and many more too. For it to flourish, we need to help people see the potential in gaming for all of these interests and celebrate and support them, both in education and in skills and jobs. Its breadth is vast and its potential enormous. Last night, I was proud to hear directly from the industry all about that potential at an event hosted by my colleague Michael Mara here in Parliament. It's so crucial that we listen when experts tell us that there is more to do in this area too, though. Scotland's chief entrepreneur said that the gaming industry could be a lot bigger. The sector tells us that although gaming is taught in college and uni, students are not taught to monetise it or sell it nor promote it. 
The potential of those involved in the gaming industry is therefore at best not maximised or at worst lost by a failure to highlight that potential and give learners the confidence to make it their career and maximise it. There are concerns also that there's a lack of funding for joint projects between academia and practical gaming development, so there's a gap between what's taught and what's practised. Education is really important here. We need to build and nourish skills in tech, arts, computing, science and maths from the early years all the way through to the workplace and inspire a passion for the subjects that together create this diverse industry. At every opportunity, those skills can and should be developed to give people the confidence to pursue the subjects, then a career in the field, innovating gaming of the future. The decisions make, we make in this Parliament can do that. They can help us inspire young people to desire to pursue these skills, to gain the tools they need to excel in the gaming industry too. Young people must know that science, technology, engineering, arts and maths matter, that their application is huge and, crucially, that they are fun and can lead to a vibrant and cutting-edge career. Presiding officer, like all STEAM, and I've added A to STEM, arts, like all STEAM areas, we need to work particularly hard to open the opportunity to young girls too. And colleagues will know that I've regularly discussed the importance of doing this in this chamber. That goes for gaming too. Presiding officer, let me close by welcoming the return of gaming, the Scottish Games Awards, and especially the education symposium that took place in the V&A in Dundee today. Bringing together sectors, businesses and educators is key to unlocking the potential in this industry. So we must ensure that everyone who wants to be part of that can be. There should be no class, glass or step sailing in the way. Everyone must be able to contribute to, participate in, benefit from and celebrate the gaming sector and all that it has to offer here in Scotland, so that it can reach its full potential and Scotland can reach hers. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms Duncan Glancy. I now invite Natalie Dawn to respond to the debate around seven minutes, Minister. Thank you, President Officer. Can I say that I am very, very excited to be taking part in this debate today. I'm really, really thankful to Claire Adamson for bringing this important motion on the second Scottish Games Week. Gaming is without a doubt an asset to Scotland and we've heard this tonight from those who have took part in the debate. As has already been alluded to by members, Scotland has a long and pivotal history in gaming and has helped to shape the global gaming landscape with iconic titles like Lemmings or Grand Theft Auto. I'm therefore extremely proud that the Scottish Government has provided funding for Scottish Games Week that gives an important platform to the whole Scottish gaming community to come together and celebrate its successes, learn from its challenges and showcase its talent. As I say, I'm really, really pleased to see this motion today though, because despite its successes, gaming has historically always received a bit of a bad name and there's always been a bit of a mixed reaction and actually too often I think that gaming is associated with the negative impacts. Ms Adamson, you said yourself the industry is massively underrepresented and I think that has something to do with this. One of the things I've always aimed to do throughout my own time as a member of the Parliament is highlight the positive impacts that gaming can have. Now, I've been playing games on a console since I was five years old. My grandpa bought me a Sega Mega Drive for my Christmas, and that was me. I've been playing ever since. In fact, I was pleased to put my skills to the test last year in Parliament when I topped the Sonic All-Stars Racing leaderboard among some of my MSP colleagues. A proud moment. But in all seriousness, gaming has always been a hugely positive thing for me, and it was always really difficult for me to understand why something that helped me so much throughout my life attracted so much negativity. But I think it's only in recent years that the possibilities have been truly realised. And I've been so pleased to hear the contributions from members tonight highlighting these positive impacts. Gaming can have huge educational benefits, problem solving, concentration, numeracy, memory and literacy. And I'm not sure if any of you have read the lore throughout games such as Final Fantasy or Assassin's Creed. And I think Stephanie Callahan might be with me on this one. But let me tell you, it rivals some of the textbooks that I used during my university degree. Within education itself, games have emerged as a dynamic tool for learning and development. Education games are providing an engaging and interactive way to acquire new knowledge and skills. From language learning to complex problem solving, games have the capacity to make education so much more enjoyable and effective. Equally, the immersion and escapism that you experience when playing a game can have really, really positive impacts when you're facing other difficulties in life. No one looks twice at someone when they pick up a book to help with mental health or well-being, so it should be no different for someone picking up a game. 
I do believe that the cultural value of games has been more widely recognised as we see more and more games being adapted to film and TV. Equally, gaming has always had a social side and for years we've had traditional couch co-op where you can enjoy gaming with your friends, work together as a team or compete against each other. But especially, especially since the rise in technology and online gaming, gaming opens up a whole new world to people who may experience isolation. And this was especially true during the pandemic when we saw people relying on online gaming as their sole interaction with other people. Inclusivity has also been highlighted tonight, and that is a focus of games which I have been really proud to see increase over the years. When I first started gaming, it was certainly not built for women or young girls, but we are in a place now where women are not just a sidekick. You have leading women characters that are more common, and best of all, their bodies are finally a little bit more realistic, aren't they? But it goes so much further than that. Game developers are looking at ways that games can help ensure that no one is left behind and everyone can benefit. And we've already heard about the games developed specifically for autistic people and the impact that they've made. And in my role as a judge for this year's Games Awards, I was also pleased to see the games built for those who have visual or hearing impairments. With the rise in technology, the possibilities are endless and the positive impacts stretch way beyond traditional gaming. So, Taking all of this into account, and I've, I've really only scratched the surface, I'm keen to show the government's support for this key industry, and equally, I am really keen to see this grow further. We've set out in our national strat strategy for economic transformation that we want Scotland to be a nation of entrepreneurs and innovators. Harnessing the power of games will help us to get there. The impacts that gaming has can be transformational, and I do believe that they fit well with the wellbeing economy that we all want to see. Gaming has the potential to drive economic growth, nurture creativity and inspire the next generation. And our £42 million National Tech Scaler programme can play a vital role in supporting games-related business, businesses, for instance, by providing wraparound expertise and facilities to startups to help them grow sustainably. Over and above this, the Scottish Government is more determined than ever to engage with and support our gaming sector. And Scottish Games Week is a fine example of this. The games industry exemplifies one of Scotland's many, many successes. The wealth of expertise and innovation that can be applied in the broader landscape of technical, technological advancement and sustainability could be utilised across many different sectors. And I really do believe that Scotland has a lot to learn from the gaming sector. Therefore, I'm absolutely determined that we do even more to realise that potential. So I can assure members this evening that I will work closely with ministerial colleagues to ensure that we understand the positive impacts that have been highlighted tonight of gaming, both for individuals and for the economy. I'm also really, really pleased to see that the First Minister is hosting a roundtable tomorrow ahead of the Games Awards with key figures, developers and game studios to gain industry collaboration and dem demonstrate commitment and understand the challenges and the potential solutions. Scottish Games Week is a fantastic opportunity to highlight the many fantastic achievements of the gaming industry so far and I really, really do want to take this opportunity to do so. Keep creating and innovating and know that your government stands ready to support you in service of our shared goals. Thank you once again to Claire Adamson for bringing this debate to the Chamber and to all those who have contributed. And thank you to all those working in Scotland to grow this sector. Thank you very much, Minister. As the son of the Space Invaders generation, seldom as a debate made me feel quite so old. Uh, but that concludes the debate and I close this meeting of Parliament.